All right, and then we'll we'll see who else is gonna gonna join us here. All right, welcome to folks who are just coming in. Thanks for taking some of your evening out to join us for this presentation. I'm just gonna give like maybe one more minute. As folks come in, as I, met, I mentioned um, to some folks already that I'm, we are gonna be recording this. So if you don't wanna be recorded, feel free to cut your video um, and we'll get started in just a minute. Got a good, got a good group here, almost 30 people. That's great. Oops, got another one coming in. While we are waiting for the last few, if you wouldn't mind um, in the chat, maybe introducing yourself and just say maybe what town or where you're viewing from tonight, that would be great to kind of. Or if you're affiliated with a like, mm -hmm. which like. Or your favorite like. Go ahead and throw that in, great idea. Oh, great, Ellsworth, Limerick. Welcome, welcome. Toddy Pond, nice. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Elena. Love Joy Pond, great. Oh, got some more people coming in. Love it. All right, for those of you just joining us, um, we are recording this. If you don't wanna be recorded, cut your video um, and introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're from, or if you have a body of water close by that you love, you can put that next to your name. And we'll get started in just a minute. Great, I love that we've got people from all over the place. Um, Renee Igo, who is CB's communication director, was keeping her eye on the registrations. And she said, most of, these, most of you folks were new to us. So I love that. It's great to see some new faces. All right. Well, I think we'll get started. Um, thanks so much. If you're just coming on again, please introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're viewing from or if there's a body of water nearby that you have an affinity for, name that as well. So thanks so much for coming. And I'm just gonna keep I'm kind of like letting people in and also monitoring the chat at the same time. So I might be a little bit all over the place, but um, uh, I just wanted to do, well, welcome you and introduce you um, to myself and our speaker and CB. Um, CB is the Center for an Ecology-Based Economy um, here in Norway, Maine. Um, and our mission is to engage the community in addressing the climate emergency. Um, we've been doing that since Earth Day, 2013. Uh, also part of our mission is that we organize, educate, and take direct action and implement practical ecological solutions for our just transition to a thriving regenerative economy. And um, we have not done a lot of um, programming since the pandemic. Um, we've gotten creative though. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, uh, we're looking forward to in-person and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but um, thanks for um, Jim Gibson. You got kicked out, but you're back in because you're here. But I think that's all right. Um, so thanks for joining us tonight. It feels good to kind of be gathered together. It's been a while. Um, so before we, before we jump right in, um, I'm gonna be putting some links in the chat um, once Roberta starts talking, um, because I'm not so good at doing that now while I'm talking. But I just wanna go over a couple, a couple things that will be on a slide at the end um, of the presentation, but I wanted to talk about them now to um, just some upcoming events and other news um, that we wanted to share, CB wants to share with you all. Um, first of all, we wanna save the date um, for part two of this, if you're local, and especially if you're an educator, um, this, that's gonna be Saturday, June 4th from 9 a.m. to noon in person at a local lake to be determined. So be on the lookout for more information um, uh, for, regis for registration details in our newsletter. Um, and uh, you can, if you're, I assume that maybe many of you found out about this via the newsletter, but if you're not on a mailing list, you can get to that from our website. And I'll, again, I'll put all these links in the chat. Um, 
And also um, coming up in April, um, Earth Day weekend, April 22nd to 24th, we're having our third annual climate convergence in person all outside. Um, and I will share the link for that too. So it's Friday evening and Sunday afternoon. So we're in the midst of planning for that right now. We have a lot of workshops planned um, and guest speakers. And um, it's, I think it's gonna be exciting again to be back together um, and, uh, and see how we can really focus on action. Um, and a couple other things that are timely. Um, it, in the main legislature right now, LD 1902, climate education policy, there's a bill. If you'd like to know more about it, I will put um, a link in the chat where you can actually read the bill and figure out how you can find out how you can um, advocate for this bill passing, which would allow funding for community organizations like CB and like other organizations that many of you probably are representative of, um, provide funding for us to work with local schools and help with professional development in climate education. So we're really excited about that. Um, also want to share with you um, some information about the Climate Action ex Exchange. Um, they have uh, regular book club meetings. The next one is Sunday, March 21st at 5 p.m. And Roberta, can you tell us the book that you folks are reading right now? We're reading a book called Climate Adaptation. Awesome. Um, and there's information about this via CB's website. And again, I will put the link in the chat in just a moment. And the next climate action meeting is Wednesday, March 24th at 6 p.m. And those are those are Zoom meetings, correct? Yeah, for the foreseeable future. Okay, great. Um, I also put in, um, I will put in also Lake Stewards of Maine. Um, Roberta is representing them as well as being on our board. Um, so I'll put in their website as well for more information. Um, if you are curious. So those are just a few things I wanted to talk about. I'll put, be putting those links in um, as we get going here. And I just wanna introduce Roberta um, next. So, so excited. Um, she is on our board of stewards. Um, she's a juggernaut, <laughs> deep thinking and big hearted and uh, such a wealth of knowledge in this realm. So, oh, I've got more people in the waiting room. My apologies. I'm looking at the chat and not seeing that I've got people in the waiting room. Um, so really excited for her to share her knowledge um, about how climate is affecting the lakes in Maine right now. Um, so Roberta, thank you so much. And I'm just gonna hand it right over to you. Wonderful, oh. and thank oh. you, Seal. I'm gonna start, well, can I, may I start sharing? Uh, yes, and I forgot to mention one thing. As we go, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and then I will, at the end, we'll have time for Q&A. All right, can everyone see my slides and hear my voice? Thumbs up, great, thank you. Well, so nice to see you all tonight. Thank you so much for coming and um, spending the next hour and so with us. And I, I recognize many friends from Lake Stewards of Maine, so thank you for coming on over. I am representing, I'm, I'm going to be wearing two hats tonight. My work at Lake Stewards of Maine uh, is as a client, um, uh, excuse me, a lake scientist, lake ecologist precisely, and an educator. And I work with fabulous volunteers all over the state who are helping to protect Maine lakes through monitoring and doing work in their watersheds and in their communities to help protect lakes. So um, that you'll see that part of my presentation, a lot of the early part about climate science and about lake mm. science uh, comes from my work at Lake Stewards of Maine. But as a scientist who is, uh, pays attention to the science, believes in the science, and uh, finds the science quite disturbing with regard to um, protecting all of our natural resources, and in fact, uh, much of the fate of life on the planet, um, I, I couldn't just sit with that information without trying to do something um, personally and within my community to make a difference. So that's how I hooked up with CB and their wonderful organization that really is um, taking this information that we are being told by the scientists and, and coming up with solutions um, at the community level that have broader implications. And we'll talk about those. So you're gonna see when I'm gonna change my hat and be talking um, from my affiliation with CB. And I also wanted to, before I go on also, um, I got a lot of help on the climate science part of this presentation from my colleague, 
and uh, one of the state of Maine's um, preeminent limnologists and also my, uh, my better half, Scott Williams. So we will, um, I would like to thank him as well for his help with this. So I'd like to start with just some basic um, uh, information about the climate science and the consensus on climate science. These three things have enormously broad consensus in the scientific community, that the climate is warming in globally disruptive ways, that this phenomena of climate change is being caused by human activity and primarily through more CO2 being put into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels. Here's our atmosphere. I always get kind of uh, a, a little bit beclumped when I see these pictures of our atmosphere. Compared to the earth itself, our atmosphere is just paper thin. It's only 60 miles thick and it is what holds life on this planet. Without the natural greenhouse effect that our atmosphere, our natural atmosphere produces, the surface on the temperature of the earth would be zero. So everything would be frozen, including our lakes, but everything and life on as we know it on the planet would not be possible. But because of um, human activity since the industrial revolution, primarily, um, we've been putting things like carbon dioxide, methane gas, nitrous oxide into the atmosphere, and they are making that greenhouse effect, they're amplifying that greenhouse effect and the heat that is coming into the atmosphere from the sun is not able to bounce back and escape in the way that it has um, for most of the time this planet has been going. So um, now we're trapping those heat, um, that, that heat inside our, that small layer of our atmosphere. This, there's been a series of, well, there is a series of new reports that the International Panel on Climate Change is putting out, put out one in August of last year. Another, the one on um, impacts of climate change just came out recently, and there'll be another one coming out this year as well. Um, but this, th this particular uh, 2021 report, which was, was contributed to uh, by 234 scientists from 66 countries around the planet, drawing from the latest advances in climate science and synthesizing findings from a wide array of scientific disciplines. Um, basically um, developed this report. And just to be clear about this, the findings in this report, because of the need to build this scientific consensus, which is not easy to do, um, it is going to be inherently conservative interpretation of the findings. And even with that, the findings are very dire. Um, the atmospheric CO2 concentrations are higher than at any time in at least 2 million years. I've seen other uh, you know, studies that suggest more like 4 million years it's been. Anyway, it was back in the Pliocene when that occurred. And that this is up in the upper right shows you what the earth looked like at that time. And you don't see any humans there because of course there were no humans then. We didn't come along until two, about 200,000 to 300,000 years ago. So the last time CO2 levels were as high as this, there was no, there was no human life on the planet. And uh, the, the levels of methane and nitrous, nitrous oxide are all similarly you know, astounding. Also, this is another part of the report, is that human-induced, hang on just one second, I've got something in my way here. Um, I'm going to go back. I think I'm going to. Oh, Roberta, you're muted. I think you hit your mute button by accident. Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. Human-induced climate change is not only causing weather and climate extremes in every region of the globe, it's altering the intricate balance of the Earth's entire climate system. That is also straight from the report. Mute it again, Roberta. <laughs> Oh, 
I'm not sure how I'm doing that, but anyway. Um, the rate of change of uh, temperature in the United States is not happening evenly, as you can see from this map. And you can also see that the change in Maine is happening faster than other parts of the United States. Um, so let's look at Maine. So this is our annual air temperature from 1895 to 2018, most recent data. And you can see the trajectory of the average temperatures um, here in Maine are going up steadily. This information is from a series of reports. This is the la latest report was 2020, but there was one in 2009, one in 2015, and this is the 2020 report, but basically um, the University have, of Maine has been doing these wonderful reports on how Maine is being impacted by, by climate change. If you wanted to check out, um, they're, they're full of information. Another interesting um, chart that came out of the report, I think it was the 2015 report, was the more hot days. And you can see that in Bethel, where in the 2000s, there was two and a half days that were hotter than 95 degrees. In 2050, it's expected that there'll be six and a half days that get over 95. And in Lewiston, that is much more extreme. We're gonna go from five to 15 days of extreme heat in the Lewiston area. And future droughts will likely worsen with the intensity of higher temperatures, those that causes drying conditions, of course. So we're expecting, it's not certain that we'll have more frequent droughts, that there's still a lot of uncertainty around that, but that they'll be more severe and longer, um, it seems very likely. And this picture came from one of our volunteers at Lake Stewards of Maine from uh, Swan Lake in Swanville in 2016, where you can see the results of the drought on that lake community. Um, Maine is also getting wetter, particularly in the winter and spring. Now in winter, not necessarily always snow like we would like, but rain and, and ice and other forms of precipitation as well. And um, more extreme precipitation events and flooding and just, and just uh, more precipitation events, period. So you can see that in 1900, there were 117 inches of rain, average number of, um, oops, sorry, excuse me, rain events per year. And in 2010, 144 rain events per year. So they're getting more frequent as well. Means growing seasons are getting longer, which from a, as a gardener can seem to be a benefit but there's so much um, bad news that comes along with that benefit that it is not really a benefit. Um, and we, we won't go into that, the growing season thing too much other than to speak about lakes because that's our topic tonight. But I think any of you who have a garden know that um, our frost dates have really spread apart um, in the year. But how that growing season does impact Maine lakes is through shorter periods of ice cover so this map, um, somebody's here, do you get in that? Um, this map was done by um, a, some researchers at the um, Maine Geological Service, and they smoothed out some lines of ice out dates for eight New England lakes, and you can see some of them are labeled here. And you can just notice that Sebago comes out as being one of the most dramatic declines in that it um, ice out, you know, has shifted almost a month, a, a different uh, a period of a month's difference of the amount of ice cover on the lake um, for Sebago Lake. And another um, thing to say here about this data is that we have kind of a spotty record of ice out data. Some lakes have a very long historical record, others not so much. And um, it is one of the things that Lake Stewards of Maine's vo volunteers are monitoring. It's very important information. And we're also monitoring ice in data. When does the ice start in the, in the lake, cover start in the lake? We have much less of that data. Anyone out there who wants to get involved in that, um, we can set you up. And you don't have to live on a lake to, to be able to do this very effectively. It's tremendously important work. One of the 
best historical records we have in Maine comes right from the Norway area where CB is located from Lake Penasawasi. And it goes back to 1954. And just to point out here that um, you, I just put stars on the March ice, ice out dates. So over the whole period from 1954 to just the last 10 years or so, there were no March ice out dates at all. And in the last 10 years, there's been four of them. And you can see the trend line obviously going, going down as well. And credit there goes to Scott for the picture and kind of bringing this to our attention. And, and then the graph was done by another CB board member, Michael Dunn. Um, so all of these things that I've just mentioned, the temperature, the more precipitation, the drought, periods of drought, um, the less ice cover. Oh, something very, very important I forgot to mention here. One of the reasons, one of the primary reason main lakes are so clean and so clear is that historically, they've been covered with ice and snow for sometimes more than half the year and at least half the year in most of the state. That is tremendously important to protecting our, the water quality in our lakes. So I just have to make sure I highlight that. So all of this is um, posing challenges for our lakes. And the fact that lakes are so sensitive uh, as ecosystems and they're very vulnerable to these impacts makes them a sentinel ecosystem, if you will, a canary in the coal mine for all of Maine. And these are kinds of some of the things that make lakes so vulnerable. They have variability in the natural flushing rate. How long does it take the water to, um, all of the water to be replaced by new water in the lake? Um, there's a lot of variability there. Long residence time for pollutants, if they're slow, more slowly flushing, they're very sensitive to the um, nutrient phosphorus. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. And restoration of our lakes is very complex. It's uncertain and it's very costly. And just to situate our lakes, they are part of the water cycle, of course, and um, they are intricately connected to the land that surrounds them and drains into them. And anything that's happening in that area called the watershed that drains into them can have impacts on lakes. So, what is higher precipitation going to do to lakes, and especially in the winter and spring? Well, first of all, water uptake from trees and other vegetation is at a minimum at this time of year. So there's not as much absorption of this runoff. So it's running off more, more freely, which means increased runoff. And in that case, because it's concentrated and it's flowing, you know, um, it's, it's concentrated basically, that has a higher risk of eroded soils and nutrients being washed into lakes. And again, nutrient phosphorus, lakes are very sensitive to it. And precipitation can have other profound effects on lakes, um, and, but it will vary depending on what's the volume of the runoff, what's the intensity of the storm event, what time of year did it occur, and what is the current condition of the lake. And there's a lot of um, nuanced science in there that I won't have time to get into, but all of these things make um, the impacts different. These pictures are just showing you a few of the things that are happening in our watersheds as a result of um, increased um, extreme weather events. And we're going to be seeing much more of this. So all of our work to protect our watersheds from this kind of um, erosion and sedimentation to water bodies um, really needs to be ramped up. Um, and that's one thing that we can do in our communities, in our lake communities, that's extremely important. More extreme weather, um, both torrential rains, floods, and periods of drought can allow more soils and sediments to get into our lakes. So in very, very dry, dry periods, the soils can get compacted, which lets more water run off. Also can also become, um, some soils become less consolidated. So even dust can blow in the air, precipitate into lakes, and it just is free to be picked up by the next big storm that, that comes along. So um, those things go hand in hand exacerbating this problem. And the fine soil particles in particular, that would be the ones that would become less consolidated in times of drought, are those that are most likely to be carrying phosphorus to the lakes. So um, you can just see how that all 
all happens and ca causing turbidity, water becomes less clear and also more, more full of nutrients. So phosphorus is the, known as the limiting factor of planktonic algal growth in lakes. So our lakes are nice and clear and clean because they have planktonic algal growth. It is the base of the food web in our lakes. It's very, very important, but um, it's there in uh, usually small enough amounts, concentrations, that our lakes are very clear naturally. Most of our lakes are very clear here in Maine naturally. And a very small amount of phosphorus is enough to change that balance. So you can see Moosehead Lake with extraordinary clear clarity has an average of five parts per, bil per billion phosphorus content. And that picture in the lower shows Sabatis Lake at 44 parts per billion, but to get an algal um, bloom like this, they may start, lakes may start blooming at just 15 parts per billion. So just a difference of 10 parts per billion phosphorus can be the difference between a very clear lake and a, and a very um, unclear lake. On top of that, the warmer lake temperatures favor a particular kind of planktonic algal growth. And that is the blue green algae or cyanobacteria. They're pro more properly a cyanobacteria. And the blue-green algaes are problematic because some of those blooms can be highly toxic to animals and humans. And we're seeing toxic algal blooms in Maine um, in places that we've never seen them before. Uh, another uh, thing to point out here is that, um, wait, hang on one second. Yes, yeah, I, I guess I wanted this to come after the next slide. So I'm going to go forward and then backwards. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about the impacts on the critters and the all of the biota in the lakes. Um, one is that because our lakes, because of this warming trend and longer periods of, um, of ice off or shorter periods of ice cover, and warming temp lake temperatures, the stratification that occurs, this thermal stratification, that's basically the density of the water, that's what, that's what sets up the stratification, that isolates the bottom water, the cool bottom water, cold bottom water from the upper layers of the uh, lake water, is it sets it up to become more uh, like a, a stronger, um, a stronger uh, stratification. And so there's longer periods of thermal stratification, longer time that the bottom water is isolated from the atmosphere and the atmosphere is what could bring in new oxygen into the, um, the, the, the lake water. Cold water fish need higher amounts of dissolved oxygen than warm water fish typically. And oxygen depletion may threaten the fishery it, itself. It could actually cause the fish to die um, if, if this um, oxygen levels dip down too low or become extremely stressed, if not. And, um, and then also cause what's called internal recycling, and I won't go into the details of that, of the phosphorus that's bound up in the sediments, could start recycling back into the lake water and feeding more algae. Algae grows, dies, and that um, happens at the bottom sediments, the composition of those um, dying and dead algae and that takes more oxygen out of that lower layer of water called the hypolimnion. So that sets up a, this just vicious cycle that ends up um, very, very bad for the biota that lives in the lower part of the lake. Plus, warm water just contains less oxygen naturally. So uh, you can just see that graph shows as the temperatures go up in blue, the, the oxygen levels go down in red. Another thing about warmer water is it is thought to increase the bioavailability of toxins such as lead and mercury in our lakes, which we do have. We already have this fish advisory warning people. You can only eat so much fish that comes out of our lakes, which should be a cause for alarm for all of us that our lake fish 
are poisoned. However, this um, warmer water could make that worse as well. Cold water species are going to be disadvantaged in other ways as well. Just in general, this study was done by Manament and a bunch of state agencies and other entities in Maine in 2014. There are updates online, but not in this report format, but basically showing that most of our iconic species here in Maine are going to be threatened by a warming Maine, including um, critters like loons, and um, or salmon and cold water fish. And that species are going to be displaced. Um, our native species will be displaced even by, well, species that are here in Maine, but also from away. So this is an example that especially in marginal habitats where temperatures are already less than ideal for brook trout, warm water species are very well poised to um, displace them. And I think I miss, I also get this one out of order. This just shows you where um, trout habitat uh, or basically cold water fish habitat is going to shift to warm water fish habitat. Maine has the biggest cold water, uh, I mean, brook trout um, fishery in the country and um, the best habitat for brook trout. And you can see that we're going to lose an awful lot of that with the shifting climate. I'll, the organisms that are going to do well are those that are very well adapted to a wide range of conditions. And this includes most of the organisms that we consider aquatic invaders. They're not native, uh, they're from away and they're destructive to our native ecosystems. And they will be more resilient to these changes. So they will have now a, an upper hand here. How that impacts plants. So this is a couple of slides, a couple of graphs. One shows that the, um, the further north one is, the faster the animal annual minimum temperatures will warm. So you can see Maine is in that real danger place for our minimum winter temperatures warming faster than other parts of the United States. And our winter minimums provide a natural protection from for our native plants and animals from by keeping things in place where they need to be. And you can see again on the right, that rate of temperature change, we saw this earlier, is also greater in Maine. So um, we're, we're kind of in a real hot spot for big changes happening to our plants and animals in, in, this, um, in this new climate. And even invasive plants that we never thought would be possible to um, come to Maine and get established here are now being proposed as, um, you know, to be added to our list of um, plants that are considered imminent threats to our waters. And there are 11 of those uh, listed by Maine law. And there's another three that are going to be um, proposed to the legislature this year to be added to this list. And that is, it's going to be a growing list. This study was done at UMass Amherst and UNH, basically just showing that hundreds of new plant species, terrestrial and aquatic are headed our way. We're again in the hot spot for new species moving into Maine. So that's, that's the kind of that news on that. And then forest pests and watersheds are, is another thing that's going to be impacted through climate change. So the exceptional water quality that we have in our lake really depends on these forested watersheds. And forests also are just wonderful carbon sinks. They store carbon in their biomass and they drink up the greenhouse gases through productivity. But things, um, invasive species are also um, moving into Maine that are threatening our forests as well. So this is an example, hemlock woolly adelgid would not have been able to survive here a few decades ago when our winters were more severe. And now with our, clean, our changing climate, um, it's poised to really decimate our hemlocks here in Maine. And just go back to our trout, the hemlocks provide essential shade in riparian areas, streams all over Maine, keeping the streams cool during the, during the trout spawning season. So that is another impact, just layer upon layer. And again, with these warmer minimum um, temperatures, more prolonged periods of drought, both of those things are gonna benefit 
critters like the emerald ash borer, which is very nearby, if not already here in this part of the state where we're broadcasting from today, and the southern pine beetle. So in summary on that part, climate change is going to exacerbate and accelerate all the threats that we have been facing for decades to our lakes. So now I'm gonna change my hat and I wanna talk about what we can do. First of all, just to say we need to do something because, um, well, it was put really well by um, the UN Secretary Antonio Guterres when he read the, the first of the science report. He basically said, this is a code red for humanity, that alarm bells are deafening and that the evidence is irrefutable. We really need to urgently step up our efforts and pursue our most ambitious path. And he meant all of us. And at Lake Stewards of Maine, we've been doing important climate um, work for uh, the whole history of our organization, really, because we have volunteers all over the state monitoring the health of our lake, uh, monitoring water quality, monitoring ice in, ice out, monitoring for invasive species, doing watershed surveys to make sure that our um, watersheds are, are um, you know, nice and, um, and well protected and resilient against these uh, storms. Um, but that work really has to be ramped up. If our most ambitious path must be pursued, this work really needs to be ramped up and we have need more of it and more intensive um, work activity going on in that regard. And the good news is that people all over the state are really willing to do this very, very important work. And a number of them are on this call tonight. So my hat goes off to you. I'm gonna now change it back again. But if we don't do something about the um, CO2 levels and the greenhouse gases that we're emitting into the atmosphere, all of this work will be for naught. Our lakes are going to change drastically, severely, and for a very, very long time if we don't bring our carbon emissions under control. So from an activist point of view, that means that we need to get out of the cone of silence on this issue. The science is very clear and the scientists, is, the scientists are telling us we need to do something. And so we need to start talking about this to our friends, our families, in our social groups, in our civic groups. Um, this has to be part of the routine conversation. What are we doing about this? What can we do? And we don't have to be climate scientists to talk about this. As Greta Thunberg said, just listen to the scientists. If we can just get this scientific information out to our communities, that's enough to spur people to action. That means we need climate and we need climate education in our school. This is the kind of point that um, Seal was making before. There is a bill at hand here in Maine that you can get involved with HP or LD 1409 to get climate education going in our schools. These children are inheriting this future and they need to not only know what they're facing, but they need to know what they can do to address it. And um, we need to help them with that. That's our responsibility. We need to step out of our comfort zone. I was not a lobbyist, I'll tell you that. I'm a scientist, I'm an educator, but I got involved with the Citizens Climate Lobby and trying to uh, influence our um, policymakers in Washington to put a price on carbon. So that's something you can get involved with as well. Um, organizing for climate justice and lifting all voices. The, one of the reasons that we have gotten into this pickle is that we have allowed there to be something considered to be sacrifice zones, places on earth where we don't mind trashing. And it is that kind of thinking that's gotten us into this situation. So as we get out, we need to make sure that all voices are part of this and um, are considered as part of the solution, including indigenous voices. It was really interesting to see in this latest uh, um, IPCC report that um, they say for the very first time, though there's been people advocating it for, dec for decades, that um, the you know, it, recognizing that even though they comprise less than 5% of the world's population, indigenous people protect 80% of the global diversity. They know what they're doing and we need to raise their voices up and we need to um, 
uh, incorporate their knowledge and their leadership into everything that we're doing. And there are some bills in Maine, again, um, that you can learn more about through the Wabanaki Alliance. And I encourage you to go to their website and uh, for tribal sovereignty in Maine, that will be our contribution to this thing that's being called for in the IPPC, IPCC report. There are um, lawsuits going forward and more are coming just in the same way that um, lawsuits uh, ended Big Tobacco's reign of in disinformation and also um, the um, uh, opioid crisis. Uh, the fossil fuel companies have known the impacts of climate change for decades, and they have um, concealed this information from the public, obfuscated this information, and they're now being held accountable. Not only the fossil fuel companies, this particular um, lawsuit is these children um, basically suing the federal government and saying that it has vi violated their rights to life, liberty, property, and has failed to protect essential public trust resources. So you're gonna be seeing more of that. We have some great other initiatives here in Maine uh, that will really help with this issue. I can't go into details, but go to these websites. Our power is trying to get a consumer owned utility um, uh, in Maine and the Pine Tree Amendment is securing a rights in um, a, uh, a um, an item in our the Bill of Rights of our Constitution uh, to ensure that people have a right to clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment. Those are going to really help strengthen our existing laws, which are good in Maine, but this will give them backbone. Also, there's just so much to be done at the community level, that uh, the personal level and the community level to transform the basic systems of food and energy and transportation. And this is the work that CB is doing so wonderfully and showing such leadership on. And um, so when we are about to close here, we can, you can see how you can hook in to all of these things um, through, through CB. Um, the Climate Action Alliance, which I actually lead, it's what I do in my free time, um, is for people who are concerned about the climate crisis and who are moved to activism. And we work in a variety of ways. We get, um, some of us are involved in a number of those initiatives that we were just talking about. And everybody kind of finds their own niche, their own place that they feel that they would like to plug in. And we meet regularly and we catch up and we share what we've been working on and we troubleshoot problems. And we just provide each other with the support that is really needed to stay active in this work because it's, it's, um, it's difficult and the realities are, are challenging. And we plan to coordinate um, some group actions with each other. We plan and coordinate group actions. We have occasional speakers. We view movies and then we get together afterward and, and uh, talk about them. And as um, Seal said, we have a book club and the current book is called Climate Adaptation. And it was actually a compilation of um, essays and um, case studies from primarily um, people in the global south who felt that their voices were not being held up at COP26, um, the climate conference that just happened uh, last year, and wanted uh, their work to be, uh, to be recognized because they are living on the front edge, edge of the climate crisis. They're already dealing with um, you know, all of these implications in, uh, to a very, very strong degree, and they're already coming up with very creative adaptation responses and mitigation responses. So again, that's when we're meeting. We basically generically, we meet the Action Alliance meets the first and third Sundays at 6 p.m. and the book club meets the alternate, the um, second and fourth Sundays of the month. And then Lucille, why don't you jump in here and go over this one more time for everybody so they can really figure out how they can plug in. Sure, yeah, just so this is the slide with the information that I shared at the beginning. Um, so we'll have part two, um, an in-person part two at a local lake with Roberta in June, um, focused more um, for people, educators, um, folks who are working with students of varying ages and are trying to figure out how to incorporate some of this information. So just be on the lookout for that information coming up in our newsletter, how to register for that. Um, we have our third annual climate convergence, and um, I put the links to um, 
it's on our website, but there's a particular page um, and there'll be more information added. We're in the planning stages now, but it, that is um, Earth Day weekend, April 22nd to the 24th. So be on the lookout for more details in terms of workshop information um, and registration information for that. Um, the um, climate education bill that is currently in the legislature, um, LD 1902, the website that I shared is, um, uh, it's a page from the Nature Based Education Consortium um, of Maine. And they've got a, a great resource there for um, explaining about the bill and explaining how you can reach out. Um, and, and this is another um, perfect example. Oops. I don't know where this slide is. Oh, sorry, at. sorry. Okay. I, I, um, I, I don't but, know how I did that. Sorry. That's okay. But, um, you know, if there are parents tonight on this call, you know, by, by, by talking to your school administrators and to your children's educators about what are we doing about climate, and, and it's not just in science. And um, CB, we've been fortunate enough this year to have some high school volunteers and interns, and they, they tell us they are not getting they are not getting a lot of this. It's not certainly not consistent across the state by far. Um, so we've really got to get it in there and, um, and climate justice and climate science, right? Those are intertwined. So, um, so that's one way if parents start voicing that concern, then, then that will help as well. Um, and then of course, uh, we've got Roberta's, um, the organization she works for Lake Stewards of Maine, if you want to find out more about their work. So um, parents yeah, so and grandparents. But yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Guardians, anybody who mm -hmm. feels um, feels tied to the school system. Um, all right, thanks for that, Roberta. We can we can do Q and A now. I've got a couple yeah, questions. I'm stop sharing. Okay, great, thanks. I've got a couple questions in here. I'm gonna um, scroll back up. So one of the questions, and so we'll we'll throw our lakes questions <laughs> at Roberta. And if there are other questions, we've also got on our call, we've got Scott Blon, um, CB's executive director too. So, and I'm sure other people here could chime in if you, if you, um, I can't see everybody at once, unfortunately, but um, let's start with this first question that David posed. What are the primary limiting nutrients in main lakes and are the cycles of any of those elements, especially vulnerable to climate disruption? Roberta. Right, so David, that the primary nutrient um, that is impacts the water quality of Maine lakes is phosphorus. That's been well, well proven, and um, and it it is carried on fine soil particles, particularly. I mean, it's in soil. It's phosphorus is a natural element needed for life. It's pretty much if where there's life, there's phosphorus, but in um, in uh, undisturbed and before climate disruption uh, lake watersheds, it is so useful that it just keeps getting recycled around and around uh, in, in the terrestrial systems and very little of it washes into the, into the lakes. And what does wash into the lakes then um, becomes the nutrients for the algae which I said, uh, that's the you know, base of the food web in most lakes. And so um, when there's more, so algae have plenty of water, they have plenty of sunshine, the two thing, other things they need to grow, but what they're lacking in most cl clear, clean lakes is a lot of phosphorus. So that holds the algal growth in check. As soon as phosphorus you know, gets washed into the lake from, especially from these extreme weather events um, and all the soil particles and the phosphorus coming along, uh, it just takes the lid off of the algal growth and, it, and, they, and the algal growth can just explode. So that's, that's why, and our lakes are very, very sensitive to it, as you saw in that slide with the moosehead sabatis comparison. Great, thank you. Um, we've also got a question in terms of, we've talked about um, precipitation and we've and runoff and we've talked about drought and then David posed another question about um, how co how concerned are you with potential for wildfire and the attendant release of phosphorus and other nutrients? Well, there you go. I didn't even have a slide on that, but of <laughs> course, yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Of course, that's going to basically <laughs> um, do many damaging things all at once, right? So you've not only damaged that forest ecosystem and you know it, these more extreme temperature wildfires are really, really intense. 
And where some forest fires that are very natural and the forest bounces back quite naturally and quite well, um, some of these more extreme fires create such a heat that um, there, there isn't so much of the bouncing back. So then you have the forest impacted, the soils available because they're you know, not being held in place by vegetation. And there is gonna be all of the um, nutrients that were bound up in the vegetation are also going to be loose and ready to flow. So yeah, I think that's an excellent point and makes it even worse. So good point. Um, and he also shared um, a, a website for the Citizen Science Association. If anybody wants to check out that out, we also shared um, the website for Wabanaki Alliance and Our Power. Um, cool. Jim Jim Gibson um, said the Supreme Court will be deciding if the coal industry or the EPA gets to set limits on CO two emitted from coal burning power plants. How can we sway their decision? So how do you sway the decisions of, um, he said it was happening at the Supreme Court, Supreme Court level. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> yeah, well. And if I may add, uh, they purposely picked that and with the conservative bent of the Supreme Court, I think I know how that's gonna go. Mm. And right. if they do that, what are we gonna do? You know, that's it's basically gonna shut the door on trying to uh, decrease CO2. Right. Another question I have is that the state is talking about kicking back 500 to $750 for every citizen, but I can't, you know, for, for, for state budget surplus. Why don't they put that into their climate goals for, uh, what is it, 2035? They should put that money into trying to reduce the amount of fossil fuels that we heat our homes with. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent idea. A letter to the editor, uh, a um, op-ed piece to get that go idea going is a well, really rather, good idea. Need find, we need to find someone with gravitas at the state and just say, you know, that's what we need to do. And if, if, if they won't do it, then what we need to do as citizens is we need to put that money back in. For example, all of the, uh, what, I can't remember what you call them, all the payments we got for COVID and stuff, I put in the window dressers. I basically donated all that money to an organization that I feel is trying to do as much as they can to improve the cost of energy usage in homes in Maine. I think those are both brilliant ideas. And I'd love to see like a, 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 an awareness raising campaign around that. So why don't you come to our next climate action meeting, Jim? And we'll, we'll strategize. I mean it. Where is that? Well, it's right here on Zoom. <laughs> You don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> It'll be in the newsletter. It'll be in It'll the, be in the newsletter. newsletter. We meet like every Sunday, meeting. every Sunday at six. And uh, first and third are the um, Climate Action Alliance. So come to- You know, you know I, I don't want to raise an alarm here, but a lot of the things that we're talking about and concerns we have are moot. They won't mean a damn if we don't control carbon dioxide emissions. Right, right. And, and, yeah. and it's, um, and, to have a very conservative Supreme Court picking, purposely picking this kind of thing, as they say, my alarm, my antenna, the ha my hackles are going up because I know what they're going to do. I and, the, uh, yeah, I, I totally see that, Jim. I think one of the the, I know it feel it it's easy to feel like it's hard to have effect at that level from from here, but I think reaching out to our representatives is you know and and relentlessly is is what can help with that in terms of. You know, well, I know it, I, it doesn't. I know because there is like, supposed to be a balance of power. <laughs> we are means, supposed to the three branches are supposed to uh, balance each other. So it should anyway, not be you, you have my my email information and stuff. I would be happy to. Great. Well, yeah, I'd love to troubleshoot that that uh, or just yep. kind of plan make some planning around that idea of returning our checks or yeah, I think it's a great idea. And the thing is, is it should have been done yesterday. You know, it's it's it, I don't know. It's, yeah. As you know, human nature is such that, oh, good, I'm going to be getting some free money. Well, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it ain't free. Anyway, um, you have you have my, I'm not even sure. You know, we'll I'm, get you, Jim. <laughs> I miss the, uh, a friend of mine put me on to this tonight, and uh, I would be happy to, to be a part of your climate action stuff. So.
All Super. Right, we'll get you in. Um, I want to I want to shout out to Christy from Ellsworth. So she's teaching there, and she's going to be working on that next week with your, Yay. her middle school students. Yay! Thank you. Um, glad to hear that. Chris Rosenthal. Um, wondering, are there any state agencies that can help if I see my lake is in trouble? And Chris, we are also on Moose Pond in Otis Field. Several of us CB folks, so we're neighbors. Um, so well, uh, can you handle that, Roberta? Um, in, in terms of when you say your lake is in trouble, um, when, do you want to talk a little bit about that so we understand what you're what you mean? Um, yeah, I've noticed this last two summers that the water level has been much higher and the lake is much warmer and it's a shallow lake um, and it seems less clear. So we've called DEQ and gotten no response at all. I'm assuming that they're overwhelmed. Um, with things this, too small a lake. The main DEP? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, what? But my oh, larger question for the group, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, was, Moose if, Pond and Otis Field. I know Tristan, you're on the call right now. Uh, Tristan, my colleague from Lake Stewards of Maine. Um, I was wondered if you might be able to check Tristan, the Moose Pond uh, page on, on Lakes of Maine and find out more about uh, who's monitoring it? Well, you can, one thing you, you need to kind of have data, right? So, and maybe you know Scott because you you have a place on Moose Pond as well. Well, I know why it's higher. It's because of the beavers are just going out of their minds down there. <laughs> They've built that dam up another foot higher, and it's going off into the woods on both sides. And yeah, the lake is a good foot higher than it was a couple of years ago, and it's all beavers. And is that affecting the quality? Do you think, Scott? I haven't noticed any difference, to be honest. I swim in there all summer and- Yeah, um, I do too, but what I'm, and I don't wanna take up everybody's time with this, but I'm just noticing a lot more green stuff growing on my dock and my ladder, huh. which makes me wonder. And um, See, that's, got that's where the data collection comes in because yeah. action doesn't usually take place until you can have some data behind that. And that's why the data collection is important. So get in touch with Lake Stewards of Maine. Okay. And, and and we can um we'll kind of vet all the data that we have on it and we'll um we can put you in touch with anybody locally who um might be uh good to contact about that. And also we can also help put you in touch with the DEP if you need more information or if they can help on any particular problems. But Great. yeah, that's I, that's what we do. So I see Tristan, you. Tristan has his hand up. Yeah, Maybe Tristan, where are you? Question? I can't see you, Tristan, but oh, there you are. Yes, I see you. No, I don't have my camera um, okay. working right now, but uh, yeah, uh, Chris, you're, uh, we can definitely chat some more. The, um, the algae growth that you might be seeing might be metaphyton. There is some preliminary studies out there related to warming um, temperatures in lake water bodies and increase of metaphyton, which is those sort of, uh, they're described as like long cotton candy like uh, algaes. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a phenotype. So it's just sort of dis describing that physical characteristic of how they look. But um, that, is, that is something that um, is a possibility. Um, but we can definitely chat more. And I'll put my uh, email into the chat for Thank anyone. You. Great, thank Great. you. Thanks, Thanks so much, Tristan. Thanks, Tristan. Um, we've got a couple more questions I wanna be sure to get to. Um, um, Carrie from um, Lake St. George. Um, if, a lake Hi, Carrie. <laughs> if a lake association was gonna focus on one primary issue, what would you suggest specifically? Roberta? Uh, one issue. I don't think you can well, do it anymore. I don't know. That's a trick question. And I'm not going to trap fall in that trap because I don't think um, we can do one, one, um, one thing. So the, what we talked about in terms of water quality, um, I think at this point for climate resilience, we need to have, make sure that we know what's going on in our watersheds and that all the culverts are properly sized and that you know uh, we're doing everything we can to make sure that increased runoff is not going to uh, equate to increased um, nutrients getting into our lakes. So that's really, really important, that watershed work. Invasive species work is important because uh, even though 
we're in a, we're entering kind of a new realm with regard to invasive species. Once invasive species were considered to be species that came from away because we brought them on boats and we dumped them from aquariums and things like that. But now species are coming here because they can't live there anymore. So it's going to get a little messy on the invasive species wow. front, but our job really is to um, do everything we can to protect our native ecosystems and even to help them migrate if they need to. So there's, there's a lot of work that's gonna be done around um, keeping out the, the um, it, it critters and plants that are going to impact our uh, native flora and fauna you know, really seriously and quickly, but then also kind of doing this um, broader work of providing corridors and things for um, species migration. Because in an age when I didn't even bring this up, they were in the sixth grade extinction right now as well, um, we, we can't be just using herbicides and pesticides to try to keep our ecosystems the way they were. That isn't going to, um, that is not going to cut it. Uh, that is not going to solve any problems. So yeah, I think I think you just need to keep, um, yeah, there's no, no one thing that you, you can do. I think we have to do all of these things if we care about our lakes. And that's why I got out of my comfort zone <laughs> to become a climate activist, which I never was before, because I can see how impact, the impacts of climate. And as um, Jim had said, you know, the carbon, um, we got to get our carbon footprint, you know, we got to get our carbon emissions under control or all the rest is for naught. So, you know, working in your community to um, address climate change and CB can be a big resource in that regard with regard to some of the model projects they've got going on with community solar and food systems and um, uh, the, you, you, the shelter work with window dressers and all kinds of things that can be done at the community level to um, bring your community's carbon emissions down while making your watershed more resilient. Great. Um, I you. see Richard and, and Yvette um, have their hand up. You've got a question in here about, I don't know if, if Roberta or Tristan can speak to about um, Alamusic Lake. Is that what, do you want to expand upon your question, Richard and Yvette? Or? Well, I'll put my, my face up here. There you uh, go. Well, Alamusic Lake has recently been, uh, they've discovered a growing uh, clump, I guess, of a variable milfoil, invasive. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know if anybody knew anything about it. Yes, we know about it. Hey, what's happening? Yeah, well, we um, we didn't know the the uh, the actual identification of that plant until about maybe three weeks ago. Now, the DNA, you know, all these supply chain issues that we've been having with regard to COVID and other things um, that impacted the the ability of the lab to do the DNA analysis as well. But we now have the word back and the community, um, the Alamosic Lake Association, the Department of Environmental Protection, Lake Stewards of Maine, um, there's a Hancock County Soil Water Conservation District and they have a Hancock County Lakes Association affiliated with them, have come together and have started a, a very extensive planning process. And um, if you send me your email, I will give you a lot more information about that, Richard. And um, it's going to be a project that we're going to need some volunteer help on. And um, so well, you're very I'm, welcome to get engaged. Since Toddy Pond drains immediately into Alamusic, yeah, the Toddy Pond Association Board is very aware of what's going on. I right. guess <laughs> one, it, and they had, they're going to have some meetings. I'm sure I'll be filled in with whatever information there is. The question I was sort of wondering is, is this the kind of thing you have to throw up your hands and say that's it? There's no chance of oh, no, not at all. Solved, or or is it is there a possibility that this can be removed from the lake and yeah. essentially kept out? Is, yes, is it that, can. Is, oh my if goodness it's, gracious. If it's, if it's an early detection, which we hope it is, but we don't know yet. So one of the things this summer is a complete comprehensive survey of the lake. And that's when we're going to need some volunteer help with that. But there um if it's an early detection, if this 
person who was monitoring the health of her lake found like the pioneer clump or mm -hmm. even in a you know, very small amounts, it hasn't spread far. Um, removal and even eradication is very possible. And there are a number of lakes in Maine that were on the infested lakes list. And after a lot of hard work from the community and after years of being seen to have no more invasives, they've been taken off of the infested lakes list. Absolutely it can happen. And that's why this engagement, this, um, this engagement in taking care of our natural resources, we need to play the role of, of the, um, the, basically I'm a gardener and in my garden, I, I just help to make sure that everything is thriving. And that's what we have to do for our ecosystems. We have to make sure they're all thriving as much as we can. And, and that comes down to us. That's our role on the planet really as human beings, as far as I can see, is to be, um, you know, to help uh, life to thrive. And so we can, we can do that. And, and absolutely, Alamusic is uh, not, not in- um, Not a lost in, cause. Not a lost cause at all. Okay, glad to hear it. <laughs> It, I, you know, Ontari Pond has a very active uh, association and does a lot of invasive plant patrol and courtesy boat inspection. Yeah, it's um, good. That's ex exceptionally good, sexually important. Oh, you know, we have so many lakes and ponds in Maine, 6,000 and um, lakes and ponds and thousands of miles of, of beautiful riv river habitat. And um, it all needs to be protected. And that means you know, people need to engage at the local level with their water bodies. And the good news is like the secret good news, that's not a secret, is the work is really fun. And it's really um, interesting. And you are always learning. And if you're working with other people, there's a social aspect to it. It's like recreation with a purpose. And so um, would you agree, Carrie? Carrie, do you agree? Recreation with a purpose, yeah? Okay, so it, so everyone can get involved in that. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for your interest in that. Thank you so much. I, I love the questions about, I know we people are kind of spread across the region here, but I love the, the questions about specific lakes because it just shows how tied many of us are to, to place and that's important and that's where it starts. So any, mm -hmm. Any last questions for Roberta on this awesome, engaging topic before we close out for the evening? Wow, great. Thank you so much for taking your out of, um, time out of your evening to join us. And thank you, Roberta. Um, thank you all for coming. She is our, thank you, Stevie, for hosting. <laughs> you can all see now why we snapped her up um, and CV has a board of stewards, not a board of directors. So um, there's a reason behind that yeah. language. Um, so um, thank you all. Um, this is recorded, and it will be um, it will be um, shared uh, via CV's YouTube channel. So once we get that all taken care of, it'll be out there, and we'll have a link um, to it either on our website or in our next newsletter, which is our usually weekly newsletter. So. Um, it can be shared with folks who maybe didn't, um, didn't, couldn't make it. And if you are an educator and did not send me an email before this presentation, but you would like contact our uh, contact our certificate, I'm looking at you. Um, <laughs> people know you know who you are. Feel free to send me an email. CL at Ecology Based Economy, and hopefully. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you back in in uh, June. In June, we'll have, we'll have fun right. on a lake, learning about this stuff. Yeah. And what, how you can bring this into your classrooms and bring your students out in, into <laughs> nature as well. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night and we'll hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. Bye-bye, Carrie. Good to see you. Hi, Dale you. and Debbie. I don't know if you're still on. Thanks, Roberta. Good to see you. Thanks, Tristan. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye.